Hello, everybody, and welcome to my YouTube channel that is Academics Accelerate Critical Care. The today's discussion will be on point of care ultrasound in critical care. This will be a very basic discussion on the overall opportunity of focus in ICU. It has mainly two purposes. One is to generate interest among the junior intensive care critics who are probably not using focus on their regular practice, but to some extent interested and they're not sure how to start about it. So this presentation can share the opportunities and the scope of focus in their practice and how it can improve outcome uh, in their IC. And secondly, some of my colleagues have also requested me to create a series of video on different aspects of focus, starting from the, maybe from the basics of ultrasound, nobology and lung, cardiac, cardiac and abdominal ultrasound and vascular. So I, I'm not sure that how many people will be interested. So I thought let's start with a basic presentation. And if I find that people are interested, people are subscribing and going through this video, and then probably I will put an effort to prepare this series. So by this, I'd like to start today's talk. So uh, when we talk about ultrasound or ultrasonography, it's a medical imaging technique that uses high frequency sound waves and their echoes. Sound waves with a frequency that exceeding the upper limit of human hearing, which is 20 kilohertz is called ultrasound. But the medical ultrasound waves mostly have a frequency between 2 to 20 megahertz. What are the characteristics of ultrasound? Traditionally, <coughs> Ultrasound images are either acquired by the technologist that happens mostly in the West. In India, mostly the radiologist usually take the picture. And it has been described and analyzed by the specialist in detail and sometime later in the hours. It has been also used by the interventional radiologist for doing some in invasive procedures. But point of care ultrasound is a little different. It is limited, that means the assessment is target based or goal directed. And the assessment and the result is mostly dichotomous. That is either the result comes as an yes or no. It is done by the clinician at the bedside as a point of care guide to change the immediate patient's management. And because of the present availability of more compact, high quality and less expensive ultrasound machines, ultrasonography has been more and more frequently performed by the clinicians at the bedside. And gradually, we are moving towards the concept of ultrasound stethoscope. When ultrasound machine is available to each and every clinician for their routine practice. So ultrasound has been increasingly used by the intensivists for their basic management. And point of care ultrasound influences the diagnosis and impact of treatment plan. As I already mentioned, the modern ultrasound machines are compact, cheap, has better resolution and portable. And it also has inbuilt advantage of ultrasound, like it is reproducible, repeatable, rapidly interpretable, can be used at the bedside. And basically, if you talk about focus, it has a small learning curve. So by definition, focus is the ultrasonography, what to the patient and performed and interpreted by the provider, that's a clinician, in real time. It is broadly divided into three aspects. It can be procedural, diagnostic, and sometimes it can be used for as a screening application. For procedural, it can be used either for static or as dynamic. Static means with the help of the ultrasound, we usually identify the, or the or preferred area for the procedure. We mark it and do the procedure without the ultrasound machine, that is blindly, which is not presently recommended. Present recommendation is for the dynamic use where the ultrasound is used throughout the procedure and it has significantly improved outcome and raised decrease the risk of complication. To so, A.V. Human in the year 1999 has described that the use of real time ultrasound guidance during central line insertion to prevent complication is one of the 12 most highly rated patient safety practice designed to decrease medical error. And the most of this data has been available for internal jugular vein calibration. And the data is little scarce, 
for the subclavian and for the pediatric subgroup of patients. Now, with more and more practice, when the skills become better, we can use similar concept for pediatric patient, also for the subclavian. Subclavian pain. It is basically used in two aspects. One is implant approach, and another is out of plane approach. What happens in implant approach? The needle, the whole length of the needle, usually remain within the ultrasound probe. That is, you can continuously track the movement of the needle throughout the procedure. Where the in out of plane approach, the long axis of the needle is perpendicular or to the 90 degree of the ultrasound bed. As a result, ultrasound beds usually cut the needle at a certain point, maybe at the tip or maybe at the shaft. And it appears, as you can see in the picture, as a hyper dot. So, along with some reverberation artifacts. So, compared to the in plane approach, out of plane approach has a higher chance of complication, but it needs lesser amount of skill. So, what are the clinical applications? It can be used for central venous axis, artery line insertion, ICD insertion, thoracocentesis, abdominal paracentesis, position of intra IBP and PA catheter, confirmation and picothyroidotomy, and percutaneous. Uh, percutaneous tracheostomy. What are the diagnostic procedures? As I already mentioned, it's basically focused. So the assessment is limited, but it is basically goal-directed examination. So we have a question, and we are trying to find answer with the ultrasound machine. So with the proper uh, protocolized usage, it can help efficiently to diagnose or to rule out certain conditions in patient presented with a particular sign symptoms, like patient with hypotension, chest pain, dyspnea, and in trauma scenario. So an indoor aspect can be used to assess airway potency and deviation, for assessment of the pleural fluid, pneumothorax, and consolidation, for diagnosis of pulmonary embolism, especially if it is a significant pulmonary embolism with monarmic instability, left ventricular failure with pulmonary edema, to assess fluid responsiveness, DVT, intraperitoneal bleed, and raised intracranial pressure. What are the assessment options? That is, here the ultrasound can be used repeatedly to track the clinical course of the patient in certain aspects. Like we can use it for assessment of the fluid status and its response with the fluid resuscitation. We can look at the lung recruitment, whether with increase in the PEEP, whether the lungs become more and more aerated or not. And for the resolution of pneumothorax. So, if I know the point of pneumo where the parietal and the visceral pleura get detached, it's basically an ultrasound language called lung points. If we can mark it and with time we can follow it up to see whether the pneumothorax is resoluting or worsening. And depending on that, we can plan our further therapy. So now, next is the screening opportunity. Screening opportunity is significantly limited. Most of the screening test is done for cardiovascular and gynecological disease. But the benefit of screening must be weighted against the harm because false positive finding can lead to unnecessary testing, intervention, or both to the patient. The US Preventive Service Task Force has recommended that ultrasonography should not be used for routine screening of characteristic stenosis, peripheral vascular disease, ovarian cancer in the general population. One-time ultrasound screening for abdominal aortic aneurysm in men between the age of 65 and 75 years who had ever smoked can be considered, though the recommendation is weak, it's basically class B recommendation. And if you look at the opportunity of the scope of focus in different specialties, you can see, except anesthesia, critical care, and the emergency medicine, a lot of other specialties are using ultrasound as a point of care modality in their practice as an extension of the clinical assessment. Does that change the outcome? Do we have outcome data? Yes. This is a study which looked at more than 1,000 procedures in multicentric prospective observational study in intensive care, and they look at the outcome. They find that in 13% cases, ultrasound helps for vascular access, and in 87% cases, it has contributed in the diagnosis. In 84% cases, either it confirms the diagnosis or change the diagnosis. And in around 70% cases, 
it contributes to have a therapeutic plan. So this is a significant change, a significant contribution in patient's outcome. This is another data. When the patient ultrasound has been used for the clinical assessment in intensive care, and they found in 25% cases, it has modified the admitted diagnosis beyond the clinical assessment. In around 60% of cases, it confirmed the diagnosis. And in only 2.4% cases, it has missed the diagnosis or could not guide in the long term plan. And it has contributed significantly in patients who presented with hypotension. We will come to the discussion in terms of rush protocol, how we can proceed a patient who present with hypotension and how ultrasound can contribute in its management. So let's start with the clinical case. So a 60 year old lady, known diabetic and hypertensive, having an underlying acute lymphoid leukemia, received chemotherapy recently, I work in a cancer hospital, so all my clinical cases have some underlying malignancy. And now this patient is admitted to the ward with shortness of breath. The patient was initially managed with supplemental oxygen and antibiotics, but because of worsening hypoxemia, she has been shifted to ICU. The patient was immediately intubated, ventilated for impending respiratory failure, and even with best possible ventilatory setup, she is required to us 0.8. We have done a chest x which showed bilateral haziness. CT scan could not be done because of this high FRD requirements. Now, on the one hand, when we are planning, should we clone the patient or not? We thought, what can we really do more when the patient is in supine? And we feel that can ultrasound help in our management? Now, for this purpose, we will start our assessment for the lung. And for lung assessment, we either need linear probe or vascular probe or the curvilinear probe. Linear probe usually have a higher frequency, so they have a better resolution for poor penetration. So that's why they are used for surface assessment. So what we will do, we will assess the skin, subcutaneous tissue, pleura, and up to the subpleural area with this linear probe. But ultra, curvilinear probe, which has a lower frequency, poor resolution, but better penetration, will be used for the deeper structure. And we'll look at the diaphragm, base of the lung, and the subdiabetic space with this probe. Next is the cardiac probe, because we need to rule out the cardiac cause of hypoxic respiratory failure. And for that, we use this phase direct probe, which is a small footprint, square shaped footprint, so that we can accommodate it within the intercostal space. Ultrasound waves usually cannot pass through the bone because of huge change in acoustic impedance. So all the ultrasound waves will hit the bone, then usually reflected back. That's why when you are doing an echocardiography, we have to bypass the rib shadow. Now, why you start with the lung ultrasound? Conventionally, we divide lung into six zones. Zone one, two, three, four, five, six. And in anteriorly, the medial border of the uh, medial border of the sternum, next anatomical landmark is the anterior axillary line, and the next is the posterior axillary line. And the horizontal line is will pass through the fifth intercostal space, just below the nipple. And as a result, it divides the lung into one, two, three, four, and five zones, six zones each side, that means 12 zones totally. Now, when we put our uh, linear probe, this is the type of picture we can identify. We can see that there is a shiny hyperequate structure which is moving uh, side to side. Now, in ultrasound, if something is more white, we usually mention it as hyperequate, and something if it's more black, we mention it as a hypoequate. And this has been compared with the echogenicity of liver, which is considered, the normal liver is considered as isoequate or normoequate. Here, the up to this shiny structure, the above part is the true image, which, which uh, includes skin, subcutaneous tissue. You can see the upper edge of the rib shadow and up to the plural line. Below the plural line, because there is air, and as ultrasound cannot pass through the air, it will be reflected back from the plural surface. As a result, it will create different type of artifact. So, whatever we can see below the plural margin is called artifact, and lung ultrasound is basically interpretation of artifact. So, normally what we will get, normally we will get, which is called A lines. These are produced because of reverberation artifact. These are horizontal lines 
parallel to the plural line, as we can see in the image. They are usually separated by regular intervals, which are equal to the distance between the skin and the plural line. And it is seen in normal and in aerated nerve. So whenever we assess and identify different findings with the ultrasound, we need to interpret them on the basis of underlying pathophysiology. So what under the A line says, it says there is air present below the pleura. It can be within the lung, it can be outside the lung also. That means pneumothorax. In both situations, you may guess A lines. But what happened? And if you focus on the pleural line, we can identify there is a sliding type of movement that is happening at the pleura to and fro movement with each breathing. And if you look at the rate, it should be equal to the respiratory rate. This is called lung sliding. And if you put an M mode of the ultrasound, where in the M mode, the ultrasound machine will evaluate the relative movement of all the points that is present on this cursor. We'll get a picture like that. Because the skin and subcutaneous tissues are not moving, it will give some horizontal marking, which is looks like a barcode. And because the parietal visceral pleura is moving, it will give a granular pattern. This is called C source sign. This indicates that there is a parietal and visceral pleura present and both are moving. So it basically indicates there is an underlying normal lung. But in our patient, what we get? We get this. We get some hyperequic, well-defined, laser-like, ray-like picture, which is also called comet shape, which emerges from the pleura. In, in some cases, it can be from the subtural consolidation also, and extends up to the edge of the skin. It moves with the pleural line and with respiration, and it obliterates the A line. So we can see there are vertical lines, and we cannot see any A lines that I described initially as normal findings. These are called B lines. Now, when we find B lines in lung, it means there is a deaeration of lung under our probe in that certain area. Deaeration means air is less. It may be because of increase in fluid, increase in the thickening of the interstitial membrane, increase of any other reason where there is a less amount of air in the underlying lung. And because of the increase in the tissue, or fluid or something, ultrasound width now can pass through the lung tissue. Once we get this, we need to know whether this deaeration is because of cardiac cause or non cardiac cause. Mostly, this deaeration is because of pulmonary edema. Now, we have to differentiate a cardiogenic pulmonary edema from a non cardiogenic pulmonary edema or an ARDS. So, in case of cardiogenic pulmonary edema, it will involve both lung, all the lung zones equivocally. Okay, so there will be a homogeneous distribution of the pathology. There will be a gravitational distribution, that means the anteriorly the B lines of the D ration will be less, and the base, because of the gravity, D ration or B lines will be more. Because the underlying lung is normal, the plural line will be smooth, and there will be no subtural consolidation. On the other hand, if there is an underlying lung pathology, there will be subtural consolidation, the plural line will be broken. Distribution of B lines will be non homogeneous and there will be subtural consolidation, and you can see the picture on the right. So, in these patients now, because of clinical condition, need intubation. Right. So, can you confirm the position of the tube? Can you be sure that the tube is in the trachea? Here, if you look at the ultrasound image of the neck, you can see there is an undulation happening under the trachea. Now we all know under trachea there is air. Until now we have understood the ultrasound web cannot pass through the air and all everything which is beyond the tissue air interface that is the inner mucosal membrane of the trachea will be artifact. That's why we cannot see, may not see the true image of the ET tube. But we can clearly identify that some amount of undulation that is happening in the trachea. During, if it is happening during intubation, we are reasonably sure that the tube is in the trachea. If the tube is not in the trachea, we will be able to identify this, this undulation during the procedure to the right and posterior aspect of the trachea, that is in the 
anticipated position on the sofa cuffs. Next challenge will be to ensure that the tube is in the trachea and not in the bronchus. So we have to identify an endobronchial intubation. And we all know conventionally, because of the anatomical position of the right bronchus and the left bronchus, mostly the tube goes into the right bronchus if become endobronchial. So what will happen? Right lung will get ventilation and left lung will not get any ventilation. So we can see that there will be a sliding movement at the right side of the pleura. You can see that the rate of sliding will be as per the respiratory rate. But then what will happen to the left side? We can see there is some jerky movement happening at the pleura and the rate is significantly high. And if we count it, it will be as high as our heart rate. This is called lung pulse. Because there is a right-sided endobronchial intubation and left lung is not getting ventilation, the cardiac pulsation will be transmitted to the pleural surface. And also we can see that pleural absent sliding is absent. And underlying lung will show A pattern, may also show B pattern. Right. So, once we find that, we are sure that this patient has an endobronchial intubation. We can also monitor this patient uh, with lung ultrasound in terms of the severity of the pulmonary edema and also its clinical effects. So, from the picture on the left, when we can see few B lines, on the extreme right, you can see that the confluent B lines, we can clearly see that the aeration has worsened. So, if this happens during the resuscitation of the patient, that means that during resuscitation, this patient has become more, developed more and more pulmonary edema. And probably now we have to restrict our field management. What about pneumothorax? A pathophysiologically, pneumothorax means there is air between the parietal and the visceral pleura. That means the parietal and visceral pleura has been separated. So there cannot be any sliding movement between these two pleural membrane. So that means lung sliding will be absent. Because there is air, we'll get a A pattern. And because there is no scope for D aeration, B lines will be absent. Even if we give one or two B lines, two B lines, it rules out the motorics. Because there is air between the lung, parietal and visceral pleura, Cardiac pulsation cannot reach up to the pleura. So, lung pulse will be absent. And another two finding we'll get, one is called stratosphere sign on M mode and the lung pulse. So, if I put the M mode and look at the change in the movement, we'll find that as the underlying air is not getting ventilated, it is also the parent, the, this no pleural movement, the lung zone will also appear as the tissue, which is called stratosphere sign or barcode sign, because there is literally no movement. And and we can see there is a sliding movement happened from one point to the right side of that point. That e point is called lung point. It's a point where the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura got separated. So, once we get this finding for lung point, it is pathognomonic, more or less pathognomonic of the underlying pneumothorax. So, what happens if this pneumothorax is extended into the subcutaneous tissue, leading to subcutaneous impression? What we will get is called E lines. These are vertical laser like lines, something similar to B lines, which will reach up to the screen, but it will start up to the lower end of the skin, but it will start from the skin and not from the pleural line. And it cannot see any normal or expected anatomic picture, ultrasound picture below the probe. Difference from between E lines and B line is that B lines start from the pleural line and E lines start from the skin. So once we get the cutaneous impression and we identify E lines, we cannot use ultrasound for assessment of the deeper structure because everything below air as we have discussed is artifacts. Ultrasound can be used for assessment of the fluid effusion also. Ultrasound beams can pass very well through the fluid 
you can see there's a significant amount of hypoid thing, which is pineal fluid, which then collapse plant protein within it. We can do the measurement also, anticipated measurement. So if the total minimum amount of fluid volume is this vertical distance of the pineal fluid multiplied by 20, and this is in millimeter. And once you put an MO, this is called sinusoidal sign. And this happens because of the movement of the collapse lung with each breathing. We can identify the underlying collapse atelectasis also. We can see that the underlying lung has some trapped air which appears as a hyperacute structure because of that as it's an artifact, but there is no entry of air on the expansion of the lung. So we can see there is associated pleural effusion which is causing compression in the underlying lung. Now, how can we differentiate collapse from consolidation? In consolidation, the, the ventilating bronchi, the respiratory bronchi are patent. So with respiration, we can see there is a generation of dynamic air bronchogram. Now, with this dynamic air bronchogram, we can confidently say that this is a consolidation rather than a collapse. And this is has an extra edge, even with the CT, which cannot confidently differentiate between collapse and consolidation, because that's a static image. Now, with all this knowledge, once you apply it in a protocolized manner that has been done by Lichtenstein, and he developed a protocol for two protocol for diagnosis of acute respiratory failure. Here, with an assessment of the lung sliding, when look at the anterior side of the lung for the A lines or the B lines, along with examination of the base of the lung for the consolidation, and along with the lung point, they give a protocol for diagnosis of either pleural, whether this shortness of breath or acute respiratory failure because of pulmonary edema, pneumonia, pneumothorax, or pulmonary embolism, or an examination of COPD and asthma. And now, presently, there are the international evidence based guidelines for use of point of care ultrasound for lung. So, next most important uh, for focus is ECO and in, uh, implementation of this ECO in hemodynamics. The primary indication is evaluation of the global cardiac function, estimation of intravascular volume status, detection of pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponade, look at the left and right ventricular systolic function, evaluation of the wall motion and to identify wall motion, internal wall motion abnormality, and evaluation of the valve function in certain acute hemodynamic instability. And we can extend this knowledge for evaluation of the IVC, get an approximate prediction of the centrivenous respiration, and evaluation of proximal aorta for dissection and aneurysm. So these are the four cardiac windows. C1 is parasternal, it can be long axis and short axis. In long axis, we can see both the ventricle and the atrium. In short axis, we can see only the two ventricles. C2 is apical, C3 subsequent, and C4 is subsequent. Suprasternal. C4 has very limited clinical application in a basic ego body. And these are the cardiac windows that we can achieve from this code. So let's start with the parasternal view. The first one is a parasternal long axis, where you can see left atrium, left ventricle. This is left atrium opening into left ventricle, and left ventricle emptying into the left ventricular outflow tract. And this is right ventricle. And here, in parasternal short axis, we can see this is the left ventricle. It is at the papillary muscle level. We can see the thick muscle. Uh, by, by this, we can differentiate the left and right. And we can see this is the right ventricle, which is an ellipsoid cell. Now, this is the apical fluid chamber view. This is left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, and right ventricle. And here is a pathological scenario. And you can see that then compared to the conventional or normal one, here the right ventricle is dilated, right atrium is dilated. You suddenly get a clinical finding release. I like to rule out a pulmonary embolism. This is a substernal view. When the first structure, the closest point uh, chamber below the probe is the right ventricle, followed by left ventricle, left atrium, 
and right atrium. And here this tissue structure is basically liver. Now once you rotate the probe in the substernal, substernal view, from view, and put the point at towards the cephalic direction, we will get the IVC view. So we can see the respiratory variation of IVC. We need to remember the measurement should be done three millimeter away from the opening of the IVC in the right atrium, just distal to the opening of the hepatic vein, because the measurement need to be into the intra-abdominal IVC rather than into thoracic IVC. And we can also measure the tricuspid jet in case of, as I already shared the video where the RV and RV are dilated. And further, we can measure the pulmonary artery pressure and can predict um, chances of pulmonary embolism. By the echocardiograph, we can rule out a cardiac tamponade also. Here you can see there is a significant amount of fluid present in the pericardium, but the volume is not the volume of the fluid, but the associated change in the pathophysiology of the hemodynamics of the patient. So even there will be a small fluid, if it leads to hemodynamic instability, we can found that the diastolic collapse of the right ventricle and the systolic collapse on the right atrium, which is diagnostic finding for cardiac tamponade. Even the focus echocardiography has been incorporated during the CPR or as a part of ACLs. What they have done, uh, they try to do the echocardiography in between giving the CPR and try to identify the cause of the under of the cardiac arrest. The cause can be because of pericardial tamponade, then it needs drainage. There may be RV dilatation more than LV, and probably the cause of cardiac arrest is pulmonary embolism. There may be hypovolemia, which you can easily see by the left, left ventricle and right ventricle. And there can be arrhythmias also. With this echocardiography, we can pick up whether this cardiac arrest is asystole or there is fine VF going on. Because the fine VF means shock and they have a better outcome. So this is a protocolized way, which is called clear, to, by which we can incorporate ACLS, uh, echocardiography within ACLS without compromising the continuity of CPR. The next, which is a more widely used aspect of ultrasound in particular, is called FAST. FAST is called focus assessment of by sonography for trauma. And the objective is to detection of intraabdominal free fluid and detection of pericardial fluid. Now we have expanded it to make it e-fast, where we also detect the chances of hemothorax and pneumothorax that can also cause hemodynamic instability and need urgent intervention. So indication is mostly abdominal and chest trauma for rapid detection of hemoperitoneum, pericardial effusion, and pleural effusion along with pneumothorax or tension pneumothorax to be more precise. So these are the four points where you want to put our probe, right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant. For the cardiac purpose, we can use subsequent or parastatal and long axis and the supra pubic. And when you are looking for extended first, you have to scan the lung fit also in the lower base of both, on both sides of the lung and also on the anterior aspect. On the right upper quadrant, we have to look at the three area, that is the infradiaphragmatic space, Morrison's pouch and hypertonal pouch of Morrison and the cord and liver tube. Here we can see this is the hypertonal pouch of Morrison and the cord and liver tube is here. This is the most dependent part. So there's a very small amount of fluid which will be collected at this area. And if we get any free fluid, we'll say right upper quadrant fast positive. This is the way to describe it. This is a real time picture. We can see this. This is liver. This is kidney, and this is the potential pathogen hypertonal pouch on Morrison. And here we can see there is an intraperitoneal fluid in the pouch of Morrison and superior to the liver. And there is some plural fluid also in this picture. Why you can say this is plural fluid? Because it lacks the mirror effect, and lung appears to float within this plural fluid. On the left side, we have to look at the infradiaphragmatic space and the sphenorenal space. So mostly here, the fluid is collected surrounding the spleen. So the sub area become very important. And if you get any free fluid, we'll say, we'll describe it as left upper quadrant, fast positive. Here the left, we can see there's a free fluid just below the diaphragm, then to the stand also in the sphenorenal fossa, along with inferior to the inferior pole of the spleen, also superior to the spleen, that's the sub area. 
Also, there is development along with long floating input. This is a real time fiction when you can see that there's a small amount of fluid present at the lower pole of the spring. So, we describe it as left upper quadrant fast positive. For the cardiac view, we try to get the window from either from the subcrified or from the parasternal long axis. And we look for the cardiac activity for pericardial effusion leading to cardiac tamponade because these patients are kind of sick after trauma, if there is more instability, or whether there is an RV collapse present or not for diagnosis of tamponade. For the subsequent view, the probe is placed in the epigastrium, probe indicators for the patient's right shoulder, and probe tip points for the patient's left shoulder. It can be difficult to obtain if the patient is having significant abdominal pain or in case of an obese patient. In that situation, parasternal long axis is preferred. Here we can see, we have already uh, looked at this picture. This is the left atrium, this is the left ventricle, this is the left ventricle output track, and this is right ventricle. And here we can identify the descending output. And this shiny structure is the pericardial. So if there's a pericardial fluid, it will be above this shiny structure. And if there's plural fluid, it will be below this shiny structure. Next is the supra view. Here we have to assess the supra area both in longitudinal axis and also in standard or short axis. Full bladder is better but desirable because ultrasound wave can pass easily through the fluid and it gives an optimal acoustic window. If you are aware of the pelvic anatomy, the most dependent part for female is the retroutine part, that is called the caldesan, and in male it is the retrovesicular space. This is the real time picture where you can see this is the bladder in the longitudinal axis, and this is the most dependent part below the uterus, behind the uterus. It's called the pouch of bubbles. And if you look at the transverse, this is the uterus, and this is the pouch of bubbles, is the most dependent part for the fluid collection. Here we can easily identify the pouch of bubbles and small amount of fluid present there. No more about the water, about extended first. Here, Along with the four fast examination window, we also include for the evaluation of hemothorax and pneumothorax. There's two additional components. So once we, for the hemothorax, we have to expand our right upper ground view to visualize the diaphragm, and then have to go up above the diaphragm. Here, if there is a free fluid, there will be lack of mirror image artifact. And that in a trauma scenario is hemothorax. And for the diagnose pneumothorax, we have to scan the anterior part of the chest, that is the zone one and zone three. And present absence of lung sliding, along with A pattern, and absence of B lines, we have already discussed this aspect, will be diagnostic of pneumothorax. So in trauma scenario, up to 15 to 50% of cases, we may get a pneumothorax. In supine chest x it can miss up to one third of this pneumothorax. And only 50 to 70% it is sensitive for detection and inaccurate for anterior mainly for the anterior pneumothorax because there's an air daring in front of the lung. So it will be very difficult to confirm, confirm pneumothorax from chest x -ray. But on the other hand, ultrasound can detect small, even on an anterior pneumothorax, sensitivity can be as high as 93 to 900 percent, which is nearly comparable with CT scan, and its negative predictive value is nearly 100 percent. So if there's this pneumothorax which is causing Hemodynamic instability or clinical significant clinical symptoms, most probably will be able to pick up from a chest lung ultrasound. So, what is the first protocol? If the patient is first positive, stable, we should go for CT for detailed evaluation of the abdominal structure, to look for the solid organ injury and other hollow organ injury. If the patient is unstable, we should go for surgery. In first negative cases, the patient is stable, we have to go for CT to see whether there is any solid organ structure or there's a potential injury which can cause significant complication. But if the patient is unstable, you have to look for other sources of bleeding, like maybe an extra abdominal bleeding from a large long bone, like maybe femoral fracture, or there may be retroperitoneal injury. And eventually in this patient, if you can identify the source of pathology from clinical assessment, they may need an immediate surgery without further work. And next and the last part of this presentation will be related to optical ultrasound. Majority of the junior colleagues may not be aware that eye being a fluid-filled chamber is a very good media for ultrasound 
ultrasound waves can pass very easily and we can get lot of finding from the optical process. Today, I will focus on only one point, which is called optic nerve sheath diameter. So we know the optic nerve is an extension of the brain structure and it, when it comes to the eye, it has a layer of meninges. So and along with the meningeal fluid. So optic nerve sharp diameter basically is the full diameter of this op uh, optic nerve sheet that is an extension of the meninges. Now, if there is a raised intracerebral pressure, there will be widening of the optic nerve sheet diameter. Several studies have finalized the values of normal optic nerve sheet diameter and they measure it usually 3 millimeter posterior to the globe because it is the widest part. And it is between 5.2 to 5.9 millimeter. It varies from studies to study. Its sensitivity is around 74 to 95%, and specificity is around 75 to 100%. To identify an ICP more than 20. So, most of the studies show that if the ICP is more than 20, probably the optic nerve sheet diameter will be 5.7 centimeter, 7 millimeter, or more. So, there are multiple studies which have come from this finding. So, to conclude, the ultrasound machine marries the human mind to the digital age. It allows the examiner to include in anatomy and physiology with instantaneous visual value. Point of ultrasound is probably the most ideal modality to augment bedside physical examination of critical in patients. And again, emphasize it is not going to replace clinical examination, it is an add on to the clinical examination to augment our knowledge about our patient beyond physical examination. With appropriate use, focus can decrease medical error, provide more efficient real-time diagnosis, and supplement or replace more advanced imaging in appropriate clinical scenario. By this, I'd like to conclude my presentation. My contacts numbers are here available, and this is my YouTube channel, Academics and Clinic Critical Care. If you're interested in focus, please follow it. There will be a lot of presentation on focus will be coming in the near future. And if you're interested to learn it hands-on, I will invite you in our workshop on Metrocon in Calcutta, and we will get hands on test on all the basic aspects of learning. So it's a one day course and led by a very eminent faculty of this. I thank you. I'd like to complete my presentation. With that.